Nice to meet you, Mayor Goff. Uh, thank you for accepting our interview. Uh, it's a pleasure. Just, uh, start with our first question. So, how do you rate your performance as Auckland Mayor during these two and a half years out of ten? I think it's for the electorate to um, say how they feel that I've done in the job, rather than me blowing my own trumpet. But I've got to say, and I, I attend very many uh, Chinese events, uh, that I always get a really warm, positive and supportive response from members of the Chinese community. Mm. And I think that's because I've worked with the Chinese community for a very long time. They know who I am, they know what my track record is, they know about my reliability and my integrity. And I think that that does boost the support that I'm getting from the Chinese community, but, but really across the board as well. Mm. So what do you think is the most proud moment during the mayoral, mayoral t uh, during this two and a half years? Well, I think there's a lot of proud moments. One of them was getting the 10-year budget through last year that put a record amount of investment into our transport services, $28 billion. We've never even come close to that. And that's the key to making our transport system more accessible and helping us get around our city. But there are other things as well. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, with a, a big group from the Chinese community, we planted our one millionth tree in our Million Trees program. Uh, equally, uh, we have, um, with housing, Today, the latest figures are out, we have created a record number of houses in the last year. 13,881 building consents. That's four times the number that we were consenting just you know, maybe six or seven years ago. So there have been a lot of things that show that what we're doing is having an impact. Mm -hmm. And perhaps on a personal level, um, it's about homelessness. Uh, working with the Housing First group, we will have housed a, a thousand homeless people in the last two years. That's making a real difference in the lives of those people, half of whom were children. You have mentioned the 10-year um, the budget uh, just now and also um, the Chinese people is very interested in mm -hmm. um, the right that you um, yes. previously promised that there will be uh, a capital increase in the first yes. three years and then there's, um, there's stipulated as the 10-year budget. So, yes. so, uh, so, so what to, I mean, if you are continue to be the mayor, will the right be continue to increase uh, beyond the, the, the target that is set by uh, the 10 year budget? Well, at the last election campaign, I mm. promised that I'd keep rates to 2.5% average general rate rises a year, mm. and I have kept my promise. So you judge people on not what they promise, but whether they keep their promises. Um, in our 10 year plan, we've said because we need so much more investment as our city grows by another 40,000 people a year, the rate increases will be 3.5% for the next three years. Now, that still makes our rate increases in Auckland the lowest in New Zealand of any big city or any growth city, mm. and there's hardly, a, there's hardly even a provincial town mm. that is raising its rates by a lower percentage than Auckland is. So we have record investment, but we also have around the lowest level of rate increases of any city in the country and I'm proud of that. So it is very actually very difficult to balance because the most of the council's income is, is right but we still uh, people don't want to get rate increased but still yeah. we need this investment to invest our city. Yeah people you know people are under financial pressure uh, quite often and you pay your rates in quarterly instalments. So I know what my last rate instalment was, I, but I couldn't tell you how much I paid in income tax because it just comes out automatically. But yeah, I think people understand if we want good things for our city, we want to clean up our beaches, we want a better transport network, we want the infrastructure for housing, um, we've got to find that money. And, and rating is one of the areas that we, we have to rely on. But I think we have got that record investment while keeping rates low and reasonable. And that's been an important achievement. And partly we've been able to do that because we've found new ways of doing things, more efficient, better value for money. We've found probably over the 10 year period, we will achieve a billion dollars in savings by doing things better. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a great track record too. So talking about the investment in the city's infrastructure and in better Auckland. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we were just saying that the right is the main income of council. And there is also a saying that if we could sell some of the asset like the water care or uh, yeah. things like that. So what, what is your comment? Well, if we sell water care, um, at the moment we provide the water to you and all of the families watching this program 
at the cost it, it takes to provide decent, clean, healthy water. But if we sell the asset of water care, even, even half of it, that's say $5 billion might be the half, half of the value of the water care asset. Whoever invests in water care will then want a big dividend, 10% on that $5 billion. So what John Tamahiri, my opponent, is promising is actually to push water rates up by several hundred million, several hundred million, several hundred dollars a year uh, for every every person that's connected to our water supply. And you know who that's going to hurt most? It's going to hurt those with families because families use more water and it's going to hurt those on low incomes because this is a, an absolute necessity water and, and it's going to make it harder for people on low incomes. So I reject the proposal to sell assets. That's a monopoly. Water is a necessity. It makes sense to keep it in the public sector where we can make sure that those providing the water supply are accountable and responsive to the people of Auckland. So what is the, uh, the argument goes like uh, uh, if we sell that or we get it pri privatised, it will be more efficient and will have more income for them? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't believe that because if you ask any government minister at the moment who is the most efficient and best provider of water services in New Zealand, they will all nominate water care because it does its job well. It is an efficient, it is a low cost provider. And if you just turn that into a profit making organisation, one, you start to undermine the model that is successfully delivering water and wastewater services to our households, but it's also going to cost you, uh, as the water user, a whole lot more money. Uh, and, you know, you, we talked before about trying to keep our rates down. Part of our rates are our water rates, and John Tamahiri is effectively promising you that your rates will go up by, by two to three hundred. Uh, two to three uh, hundred dollars a year and, and I don't think anybody in Auckland would welcome that. Yeah. So uh, talking about um, transport because people are uh, so there first there is the regional um, fuel tax so yes. that many people kind of um, against that and uh, from from what I have heard anyway. yeah. uh, and also about the um, regional fuel tax is going to put into the transport system and to make our transport better mm. but still there are many people complaining about um, AT's work complaining about the current um, traffic congestion situation yeah. so what is your solution I mean do you do you think that that traffic congestion came overnight it wasn't there before it's been there for years because for years as our population has risen at a very high rate, 40,000 extra people a year coming into Auckland, we've underinvested in our infrastructure. And we have the choice, and I said this before the last election, uh, we have the choice, either we spend more money to get our, our transport system working properly, or we face gridlock, which would you prefer? And people said to me, yeah, well, we can't afford gridlock, we can't afford the lost productivity, we get frustrated with the time we spend in congestion, but can we solve that overnight? No, of course you can't solve it overnight. When I was in government, we put the money in to build the Waterview Tunnel. That was in 2007. In 2017, it was opened. We're, we're working hard on the city rail link at the moment, but it doesn't open until 2024. Mm. Infrastructure takes a long time to deliver, but unless we invest now, they are, our road congestion will simply get worse and worse. And the really good thing is that we hit a hundred million passenger trips a year uh, just two weeks ago. That's a, that's a record level of passenger trips on public transport in Auckland and every person that finds it convenient to get on to public transport, a bus, a ferry or a train, that's one less car causing congestion on our roads. So, you know, people know that the other folk that live in provincial towns in New Zealand or other cities in New Zealand, they're not going to pay for our transport costs. But for every dollar that we get from uh, the regional fuel tax that we as Aucklanders pay, we get another dollar from government as a subsidy and we get more money from private uh, uh, development contributions. So from the regional fuel tax, that, that funds $4.4 4 billion worth of, worth of transport infrastructure in a decade. Without the regional fuel tax, that simply wouldn't happen and the situation would just get worse. Mm. I'm not prepared to let the situation get worse like that. So now the regional uh, fuel taxes are coming into implementation and I think the, 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 the funding is coming, coming yes. through. 
but uh, the business is all still complaining that they is too slow with the major projects um, getting started and also like uh, the FUA and also the CRL is kind of delayed. Do you think that um, the delayed decision or the delayed uh, implementation of major infrastructure yeah. projects will kind of um, impact the business confidence and, and impact? Yeah. Well, the CRL was always intended to be delivered in, in 2024 mm -hmm. and it will be. But we made a number of decisions that were important decisions. The first thing we decided was, unlike the Harbour Bridge where we built it and then within eight years we had to double the size of it, you can't double the size of a, a tunnel without closing the tunnel. So we've future-proofed the city rail link and that cost a quarter of a billion dollars. But is there anybody that thinks that we shouldn't have provided for the numbers that we expect within 10 years? And we'll have 54,000 people an hour travelling on the city rail link during peak hours. Secondly, when they originally put the plans together for the City Rail Link, they did not put sufficient contingency funding in. We've put another $300 million in for contingency to account for, for the rising costs of construction. And thirdly, construction costs have gone up right across Australasia by about 8% a year. And, you know, we had an international tender to build the CRL, so it's an internationally competitive price and the, the winning bidder is an overseas consortium working with, with New Zealand partners. Uh, that was the best price we could get uh, and the most reliable uh, provider of that service we could get. But, you know, we know that the, the prices for construction right across Australia and New Zealand and elsewhere in the world have shot up as there's been more and more pressure on the construction sector. So I don't like that, but that's the reality of the world we live in and we, we just need to meet those costs. Mm. Okay, so still there is no kind of major projects under the uh, regional fuel tank? Oh yes there are, absolutely. Uh, if you live out in East Auckland, and there's a big Chinese community out in East Auckland, uh, we started the construction on the Eastern Busway uh, just two months ago. Uh, we've demolished the houses that needed to be cleared, uh, we've started construction. That will provide a busway that when it gets through to Botany will take a third less time to get into Britomart from Botany than it does at the moment. At the same time, we are building a, a, a shoulder motorway for buses from the airport to Puanui, a big a connection station between rail and bus at Puanui. Uh, we are working on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the CRL in the way that we've talked about. Uh, the government is going to bring in light rail, which we need particularly to go down the isthmus. Uh, we're opening up more, more walking and cycling paths, including across the Harbour Bridge. So the sky path and the sea path, that's $100 million worth. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, people will be able, as either commuters or as tourists, to go across the Harbour Bridge on foot or on a, on a bike and that will open up more people coming from the North Shore to the city centre and vice versa and taking pressure off the cars on the, on the Harbour Bridge. So, so all of that's progress. Do you think sometimes, uh, so take the CIL for example, sometimes the, the, the kind of 50% 50, uh, 50 by the central government, 50% by the local government, do you think the, the coordination and the collaboration between the local government and the central government could cause kind of delay or...? or, or? No, no, what we've done now, we have what's called the Auckland Transport Alignment Project, where before we make decisions, we collaborate together because in the past the council would make a decision and the government would say well we're not funding that and a lot of wasted time and energy went into it. Now we've come together, we've agreed on a 28 billion dollar program of which the government is paying 18 billion and, and we as Aucklanders are paying 10 billion uh, and that gives certainty to the construction industry and to Aucklanders who know that those projects are now going to be built because they are funded. Mm. And also um, uh in your, um, I mean, on the council website, you have uh, put that house affordability, worsening uh, traffic congestion in Auckland, improve the performance of the council, protecting and enhance Auckland's environment as four kind of major priorities yep. as your priority mm -hmm. um, kind of focus. So can you elaborate more about yeah. the other aspect that I haven't mentioned? Yeah, no, those, those are the key priorities I set last time. So in transport, what I've said before, the record level of investment, $28 billion, and you can see those projects getting underway and, and, and starting to make a difference. Uh, secondly, in housing, 
because we're creating the infrastructure for housing, we've got a new unitary plan that is zoned for more houses, we've got four times as many house building consents being issued as we did six years ago. On homelessness, you know, a thousand people housed through the Housing First program. On the environment, we've brought forward by 20 years the cleaning up of our beaches. We know that every time it rains, our stormwater floods into our wastewater and causes wastewater overflows on our beaches. We don't want that. We don't want it for us or our children or our grandchildren. And within the, this decade, we will substantially have solved that problem because I've put priority on it. Um, the Million Trees Programme, we know we've got to worry about climate change. We know that there's too much erosion and siltation of our harbours. I promised that we would plant a million native trees in the first term and we've exceeded that target already. We've still got the rest of the planting season to go. We're already up to uh, uh, probably well over a million uh, and we'll probably get to 1.1, 1.2 million trees. And that means a greener, a more beautiful city, sanctuaries for our bird life. We are wiping out the predators that are killing our native birds, the, the opossums, the stoats, the weasels and the rats. Uh, really effective programs in that way. The environment is something that we really love, whether you're born in Auckland or you've come to Auckland as a city. Clean harbours, our, our, our mounts, our, our maunga, uh, our native bush reserves, and we are working in all of those areas to make sure that we protect and enhance our environment. And that's something that we as a city, all of us, can be proud of. And I want to thank in particular the Chinese community, because every time I go out in a tree planting, there's a large group of people from the Chinese community enthusiastically with their children, getting in, digging and planting the trees, and they say, we want to leave this place a better place for our children and our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something we should all be proud of, and I'm glad that we've played a part in that. Yeah. I have noticed that uh, uh, like two or three weeks before the, the, the City Council has voted that Auckland into a uh, environmental emergency, some kind of for uh, climate, for, yeah, for, for climate, climate change, climate change yes. emergency uh, kind of uh, uh, status or something. Yeah. Is it kind of uh, a marketing thing, or is it kind of uh, what no. would, would be? No, it, it's got to be real. Uh, practical it, it, implementation. Yeah. It, it's it's got to be real. We know. Well, President Trump doesn't know, but he doesn't know much. <laughs> um, uh, we know that climate change is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, in Europe, we're just hearing in the, in the, the last week, mm -hmm. temperatures up over 46 degrees yeah. in places like France. We know in Auckland here, we're getting more extreme weather events and flooding events. Mm -hmm. So we have to, one, we've got to cut back our carbon emissions, and two, we've got to uh, start to adapt to, to realise the effects of the melting ice uh, caps and the, the sea level rising. So this is not a slogan, this is something that we have to do mm -hmm. Um, personally, you know, I drive an electric car. The previous mayor had a, a big diesel SUV and a chauffeur. Uh, I just have a self-drive small electric car. Uh, and, and, and we will have to change our, 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 our lifestyle to, to stop that. We're trying to convert our diesel buses into electric buses. Our trains are now all electric and we're extending the electrification of the railway line right out to, to Pukekohe. So we've got a plan by which we cut down our carbon emissions, we plant more trees to absorb those carbon emissions. And that's something that every country is doing. We're working with Guangzhou at the moment as our strategic alliance partner. And when I talk to the mayor of Guangzhou, he says, yes, we are very aware of the fact that we have to cut down our, our global emissions. The mayor of Los Angeles, also a member of the Strategic Alliance, mm -hmm. they're doing the same there, and we've got to play our part as well. Yeah. You're talking about the uh, tripartite. Um, uh, you were recently awarded the New Zealand China Council Award for Outstanding Contributor to the New Zealand-China business relations. So what do you think of this, this award uh, that is uh, given to you? And also what do you think that Auckland and New Zealand could further promote um, China-New Zealand business relations, especially mm. for the US? Well, I was very, very honoured to receive that award. And uh, I have worked with China for probably close to 30 years. Uh, and in a number of important areas, uh, in introducing international education to New Zealand, which is now a, 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 an enterprise worth uh, probably two to three billion dollars, uh, and being the minister that negotiated and signed the first free trade agreement that China had with any uh, developed country, uh, working in the strategic alliance, which we've just been talking about, uh, working with China on, on the Belt and Road Initiative and the concept of a southern link where New Zealand is a, 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 a transitional place from, from China through to Latin America. 
Uh, I think we need to develop all of that. And why I think it's been successful is because we have developed a relationship that is based on mutual respect and trust. Uh, so when we negotiate something, we know that we're doing it in good faith. And China has become our, our biggest trading partner, $30 billion worth of two-way trade. Um, it's become the biggest supplier of our new migrants in New Zealand, our international students, our second biggest provider of tourists. So our two countries are working really closely together. And we won't agree on everything, but it is important to have that, that close and friendly and cooperative relationship, which is, I think, to the mutual benefit of both of our countries, one much larger than the other. So you talk about the South American that the meetings are yes. also attended. So um, uh, the, as I see that Christchurch is also interested. So do you think there's a competition between <laughs> the other cities as a kind of a, a hub for this? Um, I think, um, look, we, we, we want to work uh, in a friendly way with our, our, our fellow cities around New Zealand. But if we are honest, Auckland is New Zealand's only international city and it's our only globally competitive city. And Auckland is a transport hub. Uh, that's where most of the international flights come in. And that is going to be the primary base for the Southern Link, if we can get that to happen. And I know from being foreign minister years ago, how hard it is to get from Latin America to China. Um, and, and it just makes sense that New Zealand, halfway between those two very important areas, uh, if we can provide a really effective service, uh, customs and, uh, and transit service and facilities at our airport, um, then we can be the big link between China and Latin America. And, you know, I respect Christchurch, it's got a very nice airport, but realistically, Auckland is going to be the city that is the major link between those two uh, important areas. Yeah. So there are still two supplementary questions that we are doing our yes. educational uh, program for our readers. So talking about the, the mayor's responsibility and the mayor's mm -hmm. decision making. So does the mayor has its own decision making power that does not need the, the collective decision by the city councillors? No, it, it's pretty much like Parliament. Um, the Prime Minister and the government will make decisions, but they have to have Parliament to pass it. If they don't have a majority in Parliament, it doesn't pass and it doesn't become law. Mm. And the Council is the same, mm. except we don't have a political party system in Council, so it depends on bringing together 21 separate votes. So what I have to do is to persuade my fellow councillors that what I'm suggesting, because I take the initiative on making the proposals, mm -hmm. what I'm suggesting is the right thing for Auckland. And in each of our budgets, three budgets in this term, um, I've got an overwhelming majority in terms of the councillors agreeing that what I've proposed in my mayoral proposals are what should be passed by council. Uh, they don't agree on everything, and that's the, the nature of politics, um, but we have got uh, substantial support to do the most important things that this council has got on and do. Mm. So does the mayoral office has its own kind of all independent um, small kind of budget that can yep. employ recruit yep. into public? The, one, of the, one of the advantages I have is that I have a budget uh, for my office so I employ uh, probably 16, 17 different staff members who provide policy advice and do research for me and, and handle communications for me. Uh, and, and that's important, but it's equally important that, um, that I'm very careful in how I spend the ratepayers' money mm -hmm. and we have underspent our budget every year, which is a saving to the ratepayer. Um, and you know, one of the, the big things that I've wanted to change on council is to make sure that we find economies so that we can keep our rates low and reasonable. So I've cut, for example, international travel by council staff and councillors by 50%. Uh, I've found savings in the last year alone. Uh, our water and our power bill, by conservation measures, we've saved $5 million. We've sold things that we didn't need, buildings that we didn't need, that would have cost us hundreds of millions of dollars to maintain, and that's another saving. So, yes, we spend our money really carefully. That starts with the Mayor's office, but I'm also making sure that the whole of Council is careful in the way that it finds efficiencies and saves the, the ratepayers money so that the money that we do have we can put to the benefit of the people of Auckland. Mm. Is it possible that you can tell me how much is the 
budget for the mayor office? Oh, I'd, I'd have to check it so I didn't mislead you. <laughs> That's okay. um, uh, it, it's obviously in the in the millions of dollars, mm. um, but we probably underspend it by. A, I'm, I'm just taking a punt here too. Probably about we underspend it by about uh, 40, 50 percent, mm. uh, and you know. The savings, for example, that I mentioned before, instead of having two chauffeurs and a big car, I just drive myself and that saves literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to the ratepayer. Mm. And I do that because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and I want to spend ratepayers' money with the same care and, and, and caution that I would spend my own money. It's not something that you splash out. I think that in leadership, you have to lead by example. And I've tried to lead by example uh, by, by being careful with the way in which we spend ratepayers' money. Uh, we do not blow money all over the place. Uh, we do not spend it unwisely or rashly. We make sure that we are getting the best value for every dollar that we spend. Mm -hmm. And that's an ongoing process. We keep finding better ways of doing things. That's the way it should be. Yeah, so the last question, what is your most down moment um, during the mayoral, uh, mayorality? Um, I mean, if you give another chance or, or give yeah. Would you kind of improve, uh, or if? Yeah. Well, the, I think there are two questions here. Down moments. I don't have them. I'm relentlessly positive <laughs> and optimistic. Um, can we do things better? We can always do things better. Anybody that becomes complacent and says, "Oh, I'm doing it as well as I can do it," they should not be in that job. You keep finding ways of delivering better value for money, better services, finding new answers to sometimes quite long-standing questions. And what I like about the job is that challenge. How can we do things better? How can we provide better for the next generation and the generation after that of Aucklanders? How can we make this a world-class city and a great place for everybody to live? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you very much.